Hello, everyone, to another episode of Hyperbolic Orbits podcast. And today we have a very special person. This person is a very interesting space professional because he has a wonderful educational background, a plethora of experiences, and is currently the co-founder of Kepler Aerospace. Kepler Aerospace is a space technology company based in Bangalore, India, that deals with the development of small satellite systems, as well as they are providing intelligence as a service platform for the defense industry. And they're trying to solve a very, very in-demand problem for the defense and space industry that we are going to learn about today. Thank you, Kiran Sharma, for joining us today. And it's such a pleasure to have you with us and uh, learn about your education and your journey in space. Thanks for having me, Sumana. Happy to uh, be on the podcast and happy to speak to you. Thank you so much. So uh, if we start right from the beginning, that mm -hmm. uh, you went to Bits Pilani, Billa Institute of Technology in uh, Rajasthan, and you have some wonderful experiences there. And later on, you did move on for higher studies at uh, Delft University in the Netherlands. So could you walk us a little bit through before all this space journey started? What was it like during your education days? Why did you pursue a signals and systems and electrical back then? Uh, I think that was more of a happenstance. Uh, I think it is, it's just that uh, at the time, electrical engineering sounded something like something that would be interesting. When I just finished my, uh, you know, my schooling, I thought that that is a subject I would I would like to pursue. It was more of a happenstance. But once I was there in bits, uh, the environment was absolutely amazing it's a really great experience to be there because i come from bangalore uh, so that's i mean actually I come from the what is what used to be back then the outskirts of bangalore but today that's a part of bangalore as well but anyhow uh, so shifting to pilani was amazing because it's a very closed uh, system meaning it's a it's a village you know there's nothing i mean except for the university right so i mean uh, so you are kind of forced to uh, you're forced to grow uh, so that's the great stuff about pilani and in fact, if you notice something about Bits, uh, there's multiple companies that has now come out of Bits. Uh, that includes Pixel, which was which is a Bitsian startup. Uh, there is one of the co-founders of Droa Space is Bitsian. Uh, Kepler, of course, uh, and uh, I, I think there's several more. Uh, so that, it's a great environment to be in. So that was somewhere uh, where that bug, the bug of entrepreneurship, kind of bit me. Uh, and then uh, you know to pursue my uh, to sharpen my technical skill sets, I kind of pursued my master's in the Netherlands at TU Delft. Again, that's a great environment to be in. Uh, it's uh, just an, I, I, you are you are also from TU Delft, right? So you know, so uh, it's a great place to learn. It's an amazing place to really uh, sharpen your skill sets. And uh, that's actually what is really in demand in the space industry is uh, we need people with very good technical skill sets. And that's something that you know uh, that you can pick up from such places. And even even otherwise, now there are so many resources that are open source. Uh, so uh, that's basically what the education piece of the story is. That's wonderful to know. And uh, I like that you put so much emphasis on that we need people with uh, strong skill sets uh, technically. And that is yeah. also what I try to why I started this community. It's called Space Careers Mastermind. And the whole idea is that the actual in-depth in space concepts that you need to learn to work in the space tech industry uh, isn't something that uh, it's just going to come to you very naturally just by looking here and there. You need to find the proper resources, understand yeah. what is required. And I'm glad to know that, OK, now I understand where this bug of entrepreneurship started because yeah. it has a very, very strong foundation besides being a technically very sound university. Yeah. Now, if we do talk about you, Delft, I mean, uh, I understand that we have gone there probably during the same timeline, during the same time. And I remember, if I'm not too wrong, uh, the top of your faculty, the rooftop mm -hmm. of your faculty used to be one of the ground stations for... Yes, yes. That's actually, it's great that you bring that up. That's actually part of the Kepler story also, which I will get to in a bit. But with respect to the education piece of the thing, right? So. Uh, I had the good fortune. By the way, there's a team in Bits called Team Anant, which works on uh, a, a, a small satellites. Uh, and I actually applied for that in my first year or my second year at Bits. And uh, funnily, I didn't get through. Uh, I actually didn't make it to, uh, to that particular team. But anyway, uh, I still uh, pursued uh, other things in uh, space and whatever, right? Uh, but it, at TU Delft, I did get to work on the Eco Runner team. 
the Ecorana team. I worked on the power uh, train. I uh, worked on the power train for that team. Similarly, I also had the chance to work on the Lunar uh, 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 Lunar Zebro team. Uh, so these school teams are actually a fantastic place to learn both. You know, to be a part like you know to be to learn teamwork as well as to really have some kind of a some kind of a measurable outcome of your uh, technical abilities to apply it and to have a measurable outcome that's something that uh, sometimes it's difficult to get in academia uh, just purely from the examinations or the assignments so to speak or the practicals that we have but i think these dream teams and uh, all these uh, school teams are somewhere where you really get a feel of uh, uh, the depth of technical skill sets and technical know how that you need from an application point of view to actually make something that is useful and works so that is something again that it makes uh, makes a pretty big difference i would say and uh, the ground station thing that you brought up that's actually very interesting because uh, when i was in tu delft uh, somebody called navneet singh who is the founder of kepler aerospace he uh, he was at that time he was working on the ins uh, satellites at isro uh, so he was working in ISRO and he was a systems engineer for the INS satellites and uh, they seemed to require a ground station. So they called us up uh, and said, oh, you guys have a ground station in your university. Uh, can you give, please help us, you know, do TMTC, telemetry and telecommand from your uh, ground station at TU Delft. And uh, I, we said, yeah, okay, sure. Why not? Uh, uh, let's go do that. And uh, so, uh, so the other person that was involved was our uh, CTO, our chief technology officer, Sujay Narayana. He was the main person for the ground station. I was working with him. He is my senior. He was doing his PhD at the time when I was doing my master's. So I was working basically for him uh, on the ground station. And we were su supporting the other person, Navneet Singh, who eventually became the other uh, founder for Kepler Aerospace. So we supported the INS series from our Delft ground station. And uh, eventually, once we all graduated and all this, uh, we still now we have a network of ground stations across the world, including Netherlands, Mauritius, uh, Finland, Argentina, Australia, and several other places. And we have all these ground stations. Now we offer it as a service to ISRO as well as to other uh, uh, satellite makers, you know, satellite operators. So that's something that did happen. So like I said, uh, we are very grateful for the amazing environments that we have been a part of. I can understand. It's like, uh, and, and not just the conducive environment, but also you recognizing the correct opportunities and the right people coming together at the right time also, I think, helps. But before we completely move to the Kepler Aero story, I just have one uh, curiosity. It's that you did participate in uh, two of the most uh, popular dream teams, uh, Luna Zebro and uh, Eco Runner. Could you tell us a little bit about those two projects? Oh, it's a great. Uh, those are great teams. I mean, the Ecorona team is a fantastic team uh, to work in. I, I had, I only had the chance to work for them for maybe three to six months. I would say maybe a one quarter or two quarters. But I was working on their powertrain, uh, so we were, uh, were basically doing the sizing calculations and trying to integrate uh, supercapacitor into the powertrain. So that's something that we were doing there. But uh, overall, that's such a great team, and the competition environment is just uh, amazing, and uh, it's a very uh, you know, it's a very good place to learn, and it's also a very good place to kind of interact with industry because uh, we were at the end of the day we were sponsored by industry, right? So uh, it's a great place to interact with industry as well because they are always looking out for the next uh, great engineer, or the next good engineer that they can pick up for themselves. So it's a place full of opportunities. And with respect to the Luna Zebro, that's something uh, you know that's continuing. That's also a team that was, as I would say, uh, at that time it was. Uh, the lunar, the space part of it was kind of uh, relatively new, I would say. But the Zebro project itself has been going on for several years. And again, that's a fantastic learning platform. Uh, so these are all educational tools. And I think uh, people who are into education and academia should really adopt these systems. Uh, these, this is something that I haven't seen very widespread during my undergrad time, I would say. Uh, I think it's picking up now, though. Uh, however, I would say that those these learning platforms are a great way to motivate students because I hear I hear uh, whenever I interact with uh, academia here in India, I, I get I usually hear a similar kind of complaint. Oh, students are not motivated. Oh, students don't listen to us or something. And I always have the same response. Like, you know, you have to give them something that they will respond to. It has to be an exciting toy. Like, 
the lunar zero or the eco runner and things of this sort so that's something that i think really motivate is I, i mean see at the end of the day the point is that uh, what is required in industry might seem boring for somebody who is at that uh, so so for me undergrad was between when i was what uh, maybe 17 and 21 so uh, so at that period of time if you want to motivate somebody in that age bracket it has to be something that's presented in a very exciting way otherwise that learning outcome is going to become very difficult to drive so these are things that uh, uh, i've seen in uh, tu delft and other such places and i think it's catching on now uh, we i have also sort of been a uh, let's say a volunteer or an evangelist of such uh, building such teams and such platforms in uh, universities uh, so that's something i think that really helps i agree i totally agree uh, it's in i understand a lot of universities do have a lot of new kinds of teams right now even not just in space i would say a lot of indian universities have satellite teams now but uh, also in other fields like they have different machine learning and ai learning kind of tools and platforms they participate in various kind of competitions and uh, i understand what you're saying like uh, in our department in aerospace in tu del there was the major team train right. back then the rocket team and the kind of exposure you get uh, it is good enough to motivate because it's very real life hands on yeah. that you do instead of sitting and staring at a picture of a rocket if you actually go to uh, go hands on on how to build a rocket it's a totally different experience so yeah. uh, i can and i'm understanding how the inspiration and the motivations is built uh, in, into your career and now um, moving to kepler aerospace it is quite a unique company in uh, many senses we'll come to your products uh, in a bit but before that when you met your co-founders was there anything particular that made you choose uh these set of products as your primary mvp when you started the company or how did it come together for all of you uh, right. being in that kind of environment at right. that time so the ground station piece is like i mentioned like i was say speaking about earlier uh, these are all just very happy happenstances uh, uh, but what really drives us is our you know our just interest in tech and in space tech in particular that's what really drives us and uh, what we are trying to do at kepler is we are trying to use space tech to solve problems in industry uh, primarily we are, are trying to solve for intelligence sp- uh, intelligence from space the platforms thereof uh, so that's what we are trying to solve for and we see that the industries where these have the biggest applications are things like you know shipping and things like uh, insurance and maritime and uh, defense especially and uh, that's where our focus is and uh, another great thing that happened to us was that a uh, part of the vision that we had uh, luckily we were able to work with uh, industry associations like uh, ispa for example indian space association and satcom india association and such industry associations to be able to uh, you know to be able to push our uh, the vision that we had to build this constellation of uh, geo intelligence satellites etc so we were luckily able to push through these associations to uh, convince government customers uh, such as say defense space agency for example to uh, put out these as idex challenges and luckily we won uh, two of those idex challenges uh, idex prime challenges to be you know more precise uh, but we won those and uh, so now for them we are building out a constellation small constellation of a technology demonstrator set of satellites uh, so that's basically how uh, the thing the whole thing came together but one thing that we really uh, kind of learned along the way is that so there's different layers in a company right so there is uh, there is uh, there's the vision and the motivation piece of the story and then there is the piece of the story which is the overall business model uh, which speaks more in terms of what is the problem that you're trying to solve and then there's another layer below that which is i would say it's the operating model meaning what are the tasks that are specifically involved what are the departments that you need to build out so that's the layer after that and uh, and then at the end of the whole thing uh, there's also the revenue model you need to know who you're charging for what uh, so when all of these all these pieces have to be built and each of this is a pretty big task so you're embarking upon something that's pretty large so it's definitely a very challenging uh, thing that we are trying to do but uh, we you know uh, we have taken it up and uh, and luckily things are going uh, fairly well for us 
that's that's good to hear but it's also because you did i think come with a lot of preparation you along with your co-founders did not just jump into it uh, completely into an unknown so uh, i have one question though when you you were the inception days of kepler aerospace it was also the same time when uh, the european new space uh, ecosystem was also right. starting to develop so what was it that you uh, kind of saw at that time as unique opportunity to establish a country, uh, company in India and not in Europe? Was it that, okay, no, I'm going to go back and do it back home or was it some other driver? Uh, no, we, we were we were very inspired. And uh, uh, so, for example, a company that really got built right in front of my eyes, I would say, uh, our company is like, uh, let's say, I, ISIS Space and uh, Hyperion. These are companies that I've seen the founders literally uh, build it up from scratch in front of me. I've seen it uh, happen and it was just completely amazing what they did. Uh, so that's something that I did see. And uh, but the thing for us uh, was that, you know, we wanted to build this out uh, here in India. And uh, that it, it, I would say that it was kind of always a part of our plan to kind of be based out of here. Uh, but having said that, we still have very regular interactions with all our colleagues in the Netherlands, as well as the European space ecosystem, as well as, you know, uh, so I would so the thing about space is that uh, it's by definition a global industry because you're going up in space, right? So you're kind of it's by kind of by definition global. I don't think that I don't think that anybody in the new space economy really thinks about uh, business in a local way. I think everybody thinks of it in a global way. I think it's by definition like that. And we also have a small, because our, uh, uh, so Sujay is still based out of the Netherlands. So we still have a presence uh, in Europe and, you know, uh, multiple other partners as well. We partner with several companies. Even in Finland, we have a good presence with several partners there as well. So yeah, you are embarking upon something that's by definition global. So you're not uh, limited by the coincidence that you live somewhere. I'm very happy you touched upon that. I'm very happy that you presented this as a global industry. I mean, no matter, uh, it might come across as, okay, this industry is growing in this country, this industry is developing in this, uh, the space industry is developing in this particular country, but I really think there are any, be it a big space agency mission or a, a startup that is trying to build its new products. I don't think any of this is possible without global co collaborations, yeah. especially in today's day and time. So I'm glad you thought of, uh, you brought that up. And now the kind of services you're offering, the kind of products, is it something that uh, that you had started initially with or did you kind of go through sort of iterations to uh, narrow down your product ranges to what it is currently now? Yeah, the uh, basically it's completely driven by our interaction with customers. Uh, we have been, uh, you know, speaking with them and working with them on what it is that they want and what it is that we think. We, I mean, so their wish list is always uh, is always too long. It's it's always going to be the case. Every customer's wish list is always going to be too long, and uh, we are trying to. Uh, basically, what we did was we sat with them for several several meetings over. This is I'm and I'm speaking of several over several months, right? So uh, so we sat with them and worked out what it is that their requirement is, where their pain points are, and how we solve for that. And then we come back and internally work with, OK, how many of these things can we actually do? And how many of these can we do reliably? How many of these things can we do uh, you know, over and over again? And uh, work all of that out and uh, you know, uh, arrive at something that we are doing. So luckily for us, uh, we took a piecewise approach. Uh, so for example, we are building our uh, satellites, right? So. Uh, one thing that's happened for us is one of the first pieces that we built out of that, like the communication systems, the uh, the RF part of the thing. So the communication systems and other RF part. Uh, so we managed uh, to actually find other use cases for that as well. So we, so for example, what came out of our design for the satellites communication system, we adopted it for defense platforms, and we are actually sold it to. So we are part of the Naval Tejas program. We are giving the communication systems for that, and we are also giving the uh, communication system for the Abyas drone program. Uh, we are also giving, uh, so that's the communication piece. We are also doing, so uh, the other part is the OBC, the onboard computers. Uh, so that's again something that we originally built for the satellites, uh, but uh, we also managed to adopt that payload uh, data handling and the onboard computer systems for the Gaganyaan missions, uh, astronaut bio-west monitoring system. We are part of that program as well. So the idea is we just, 
uh, start building towards the core goal and then as and when we get a chance to monetize it uh, by putting it into something that's an ongoing program we have just uh, figured out figured out a way to do that and that i would say is kind of what uh, our approach is sounds really lovely and uh, why i'm asking you the questions in this fashion is because uh, uh, the idea of this uh, community is to bring this podcast to people who are just either starting their careers in space or they're in a position where they want to pivot to a career in the space industry and space entrepreneurship right now is one of the prime and the most attractive career choices for uh, many young uh, engineering students or young professionals and uh, since the beginning of this talk today you have been focusing a lot about the different aspects of actually starting a company and what i really love is when i do speak to a lot of uh, fourth year fourth year students or graduates early graduates the idea that yes uh, it's very much possible to have your own space tech company now and yes we do have uh, ideas on what kind of products we would like to build what kind of services we'd like to build but the idea that uh, it's just not enough to have a cool product in your mind you need to have an understanding of the landscape of the market yeah. of uh, the revenue model that you mentioned of what kind of options uh, you could have so i would like to ask you this if somebody who is thinking of maybe in the second or third year and is thinking okay i do have a sense of entrepreneurship i think i can do build a company what kind of advice would you give to them starting and given this challenge that space technology defense technology already is complex in many different layers on top of that entrepreneurship is not something that you can always learn theoretically so what kind of advice do you have for people who would like to uh, maybe in the coming future uh, build their own companies in space uh i would say that you know uh, the way you should approach it would probably be that uh, you pick up so the tech piece of your company is probably something that you build with space in mind the tech piece of it alone but when you're building out the business model try and figure out what problem it is that you're trying to solve and uh, whether your product fits into that market so you're going to have to spend a lot of time in just figuring out the product the market and the product market fit this piece is pretty much the most crucial piece it's also the most difficult part but do the most difficult thing first i would say because that's uh, the most important thing to crack so try to find a great problem to solve and if it is something if if your motivation is that uh, you want to be specifically doing something in space alone then i would say focus on so the, the okay anyhow you're going to have very limited resources at least to start with uh, so you're better off uh, putting all of your resources into one narrow a uh, part of the problem instead of attempting to uh, so okay the overall vision can be that you want to do this huge gigantic thing but the first piece is you're going to have to solve like say component wise or you have to solve say subsystem wise or something like that so i would say that focus on one singular problem and uh, try to solve for that and the market see one thing is uh, true that you are you are motivated as an entrepreneur but please believe me about this the market is, the customers are equally motivated to find you like the customers are just as motivated as you to come find you so if you do something believe me the people will come find you it's not going to be a problem so uh, but but yeah of course please do work uh, with the customer to understand where the pain point is so you're not solving for something uh, blind blindly uh, but yeah try to interact with customers as much as possible and try to figure out uh, how you're going to be adding value to them and to their pain point and so on and then try to figure out how to productize that i would say that's that should be uh, vaguely i mean or broadly speaking that should be your approach and that's that's a wonderful advice and uh, lastly before uh, i let you go the one question that i do have is uh, i can understand that uh, it is it sounds like uh, you have gone to the best institutions you have a wonderful company that you're running but i'm sure this is not come easy i mean there have been hurdles and challenges as an entrepreneur yourself that you might have uh, faced through so i would like to uh, ask a little bit about what kind of uh, personal challenges did you face as an entrepreneur when you started your journey and especially in this field and if you could tell us a little bit about it uh this field is quite hard uh, the reason space is hard is because there is too many reason okay uh, don't forget the re that the reason that uh, historically only governments have been into space is because only governments have that kind of a risk appetite don't forget that 
so that's something that's very important to remember that it is extremely risky. Uh, there is a narrow window of opportunity that is opened up primarily because uh, of uh, components becoming better because of automotive industries and innovations in those uh, side of things. Uh, and, you know, uh, with the overall new space economy kind of uh, springing into thing. But the challenge, I would say, for us is that uh, the market is still something that is forming. It is not something that's a mature market. So, so I, a mature market would be something like, let's say, steel market or cement market. Those are very established. So you know for sure that your product has a market. In this case, that's in our case, in our industry, that's not going to be the case. You are trying to fight battles on all fronts. You're trying to basically convince on the customer side as to why uh, your product makes sense. They are trying to convince on the procurement angle. You're trying to convince on so many different things. So it's a very difficult uh, uh, place to actually, uh, you know, to be able to figure out the business piece of the story, which is why uh, most companies are chasing after uh, venture capital, because otherwise, how are you going to uh, fund it, right? Uh, so that's where we kind of luck. We were uh, lucky enough to kind of figure out a way to uh, generate revenue uh, without having to depend on that uh, piece necessarily. Because at the end of the day, uh, there's a limited amount of uh, VC money that's available in the space industry per se, right? It's 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 an evolving thesis for them as well. So for the VC industry, it's an evolving thesis. So uh, so I would say that you know it's very challenging to do that piece of the story where you're waiting for the market to form as you're building your product. And that's, uh, so, I mean, that's a ch the challenging piece, but then there's also good things about that story uh, because I would say that in the space industry, there's probably the highest amount of uh, collaboration and working together that I would say. Uh, it, that's especially because we are depending on somebody and we are, some, and, and so on. Like, okay, let me give you an example, right? So we want our uh, satellites to go up. We are waiting for the launch vehicle guys to build out their thing and prove it. So we are really cheering for, the sky roots and the agnicoles to go and do the thing because we want them to get ready for us to launch that thing so we're just cheering them on and similarly uh, so the component guys who we procure from let's say for example we procure uh, electro optical systems we don't build electro optical systems in house we procure it from our suppliers and so there's a startup that's doing that as well so we're cheering them on as well right and and likewise so so luckily uh, i would say that it's probably a uh, the good thing about the industry is that everybody's cheering everybody else on but uh, what's behind it is essentially the fact that it's a forming industry. It's something that's being formed. It's not a mature market that you're targeting. So uh, those th that's probably what the most difficult and challenging part of the whole thing is. That's beautifully put. And I think in such a such an early stage or nascent market, it's always nice to have not just because you're dependent on other uh, companies to uh, for. Uh, procurement or for collaborations just in technical terms, but it also kind of helps build the whole ecosystem right from scratch. I think that's what everybody in the new space economy does so beautifully. So thank you, Kiran. Thanks uh, so much for sharing your story with us. It has been very, very informative. Uh, I have learned a lot from you today, and I'm sure everybody who's, uh, who is watching today has a lot has had a lot to learn from you as well. And uh, if you're watching this, I would say that, yes, it is difficult to have a career in the space industry. We see that space industry is going to top billions of dollars in the coming years. Yes, all of that is true. But uh, when you listen to professionals like Kiran or the other uh, episodes that we have had earlier in this podcast, it just kind of gives you the guiding light that is uh, aimed to make your journey a little easier in this field. It is possible, but it's also difficult. So all we could do is just show you the correct path that uh, the actual professionals have followed and they are looking forward to. So if you would like to uh, stay in touch with us, join, subscribe to this channel. And also you can join our Space Careers Mastermind community. It's a free community. I'm going to put the link in the comment section. You can sign up. We have many exciting events going on there. There are a lot of videos that I myself put up on different space technology topics for you to learn and for you to help build a career in this field. And lastly, thanks a lot, Kiran. Thanks for taking out the time and sharing this with us. It has been wonderful. And I wish all the best to you and to entire uh, team of Kepler Aerospace. Thank you so much, Sumana. Thanks for having me.